welcome. Um, so yes, everybody, very, very, very excited. Um, this has been a series that I've been running um, over the last two, three months called the Online Community Stories. And I have brought entrepreneurs within B2B media and events on how they're building sustainable and recognizable communities. Every single entrepreneur, every single organization that I have invited to these conversations are doing something that I think and the audiences that they work for, that they serve, um, uh, think that they're doing something remarkable. Um, today, um, it's a very special day for me because um, as a community's leader, as a, as a, as a strategist in the, in the events industry and, and for the media publishers, communities is the thing now and it's so important. And these two amazing individuals that I have with me today, here with me today, it are basically the people that invented, I would say invented, or the people that were talking about communities even before this was the thing. Right. And let's think about 1998 when uh, Penny and Thomas founded um, E Academy. And that was a, an online community. This is before Facebook and before LinkedIn. Right. And this is a community that grew to 650,000 members. And it was amazing. I was a member of it. And I know that many members of the ones that are like probably uh, uh, watching this session today were members of it. It was networking. It was everything that, that you really wanted to do. It was everything that we're now talking about, probably 20 odd past years about it. Online communities, people interaction, love, networking, everything. So to give you some context, and I would like you guys kind of introduce yourselves, but the two individuals that we have here today, that's why I'm so excited because I've always been intrigued about this story. I've always been intrigued about the why why something of the people that have been running communities for a long time, for more than 20 years, one of the biggest communities in the world, have now decided to launch a business called BIP100, which is an amazing community of only 100 people. And the story is amazing. I am a member of 100. I'm a proud member of BIP100, excited to be part of it. But just to give you guys a... Uh, uh, a taster of, 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 of what we've got, of the two people that we've got here. In 1998, they founded the Academy, 650,000 members. Between the two of them, they've sold three businesses. They've published nine books between the two of them. In, two, in 2013, Penny was awarded the OBE for services uh, provided through e Academy and the contribution to entrepreneurship and social digital economy. Penny wrote the business, the digital business Britain manifesto. So as when I'm saying to you guys that these guys have wrote the book, wrote the playbook, it's for real. Welcome, Penny. Welcome, Thomas. How are you? Thank you. Um, beautiful uh, introduction, Ricardo. Thank you very, very much indeed. <laughs> Penny, how are you? Uh, do you want to give us a little bit of, I mean, I, I can't really, I have not met anyone that in, in, in the UK that has not ever met you, but do you want to give us a brief introduction <laughs> of who you guys are? You guys are prolific on LinkedIn. You guys are prolific everywhere. So, but if there's anyone in the audience that doesn't know you, do you want to give a little brief intro before we get into it? Well, I think you introduced us brilliantly and, and um, very lovely for our self-esteem because as we will probably get into, <laughs> You know, it's we've had some bumps and bruises along the way um, and might be one of the reasons why we really believe in what we're creating now, because the world has changed a lot in the last 23 years. Um, and, and I think it's fascinating going on this journey with you today because we're going to go on a journey from, you know, really when we started Academy in 98, the term social networking had not been created. We called it an online business what was it we called it a, a social business social business community a social business community we called it that's right and then the terms got got created and competitors came in uh, though we didn't see them as competitors at the time um and you know uh, all the way through to now 23 years on that none of us can really imagine um experiencing business without these tools so 
it's going to be a good journey with you today. Amazing, amazing, and thank you. So I guess to, 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 to start with, um, 1998, the community thing you guys started, pioneered that element. 2021, the word community is on every business leader, any B2B organization, any B2C organization that has a very solid, serious, digital mindset uh, on how to engage the, the customers they're thinking about online communities. From that point to now, what do you see has been the evolution? How, how has this online communities thing evolved on how it was now and how it is right now? What's, uh, what's your take on that? So uh, my answer to that would be, Penny and I have always believed in paid communities. We never believed in free. So looking at the 650,000 members, members either pay two pounds a month or 10 pounds a month or a hundred pound a month for sort of a bronze, silver, gold level. When, when free arrived with LinkedIn in 2003 and then 2004 with Facebook and then 2006 with Twitter, free was the new thing. Everything was free. Everything should be free. All things should be free and the world would be fantastic and we all live off advertising. If we look at the 20 years performance of LinkedIn, Facebook and Twitter, it's been fantastic for their shareholders. It's been fantastic for their founders. But have those platforms really delivered for their users? No, because they're free. And where it's free, it's very hard to find intimacy, trust, belonging and self-esteem. Uh, I'll let Penny give her view on that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Thomas, uh, you know, he and I are very different. I see grey and Thomas sees black and white, <laughs> which is which is fantastic. And so anybody listening, watching will see that, that I see the world a little bit in a more, I don't mean grey as in a dull colour, I just see more of a blended thing. I think Thomas is right in that, um, you know, I do believe in free. Okay, but I want us to make sure people understand that that isn't purely for commercial reasons. Uh, it is actually for the user experience because what we experienced, we, we started off a little bit free, then we went into paid membership and we had these different levels that Thomas talks about. We saw that the experience people were having that were only paying $10 or 10 euros or 10 um, pounds were ha was having was far richer. And it wasn't purely because we were giving them more tools. It was because when you paid for something, you, you committed to it and they looked out for other people in the network that were also a paid user. And, and literally you could connect with a free member but people wanted to silo themselves into where are the other people that truly believe in this community and are here and they've got some skin in the game. And so we, we could observe that and we it was an experiment in a way, um, but we could observe that. The other thing is that, um, you know, community is becoming huge. There's 10 million um, Facebook groups now and probably more than that stat that I heard plus all the other places, LinkedIn groups, people having communities on Disciple and Peerboard, etc. But actually, they might call them communities, but I don't think many people know how to run them as a community. Many people run them as networks, not as a community. And I think it's really important to understand the difference. Now, I always come from an emotional place. You know, I, I am an emotional person. And, and, and if you did psychometric tests with people, some people come purely from, I want results, I want results. Other people say, I want an experience, I want feelings. Um, what we believe community has is a feeling, a sense of belonging to it, as Thomas said. And what's very interesting to us is that we've been running for the last 17 months, a survey that people could take, our, our business health check. There's a question on it, are you lonely in business? And it's growing. And you wonder why when we're the more connected as a society than ever before, why are people feeling lonelier? And it really is down to the fact that they haven't got a sense of community anymore. And community, as Thomas says, it gives you a sense that you matter, that people are listening to you, that you can be yourself, that you can close the gap between this is my identity and this is my truth. 
Um, but not many people know how to run communities. Very similarly to, you could have loads of pubs across the country and you can walk into some pubs and absolutely love the atmosphere in it. And the landlord greets you with a smile and he remembers your name the next time. And he then starts to remember what drink you like. Or you can walk into a pub and no matter how many times you walk into it, nobody recognizes you. To me, one is a utility and one is a community. Yeah, you're totally, you're totally right. And I love the analogy of the pubs with, with, the, um, <clears throat> with communities. Um, one thing that I wanted to, to tap into, um, Penny, and for the context of the people listening in. So, Thomas, you said you always believe in, 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 in paid, right? So for the ref, everyone's reference, um, Academy had 25,000 paid members at the time. So it's the free and the massive growth to 650 of those that were free came after before. How, how, how was that makeup then? Just, just predominantly for the content, because I know that many people will be interested to hear more about that. It's interesting because uh, I'm, a, I'm a historian, now a sort of digital historian, because I've been online for 30 years. But uh, I remember the very first day, December the 7th, 2002, when we got our first paid member. So we had about 10,000 members by then. We started in 98. We mainly did physical events around the UK, and then they spread into Belgium and the Netherlands and gradually spread across Europe and then around the world. But that very first paying member, Leon Benjamin, I even remember his name because he sent us our first 10 pounds on PayPal. Um, that month in December 2002, we had 36 paying members out of about 10,000 total on the list or on the community. If you like. By 2006, that had reached 30,000 subscribers across those levels, the two pounds, the 10 pounds, the 100 pounds, depending on the level, bronze, silver or gold. Mm -hmm. So really, it, the paying members grew as a tiny percentage which you can see 30,000 out of 650,000 is less than half of 1%. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's a tiny, so you've got like one in 200 people who want to contribute and get more by making a payment. And those people get a lot more because the moment you make that payment, the moment, the moment you give that piece of exchange, like you with Bit100, you give commitment of time. And communities only work if you invest time. The, the, I think the trouble with free is there is no commitment of time. And the trouble with free, I think, is you're rewarded with tokens, now called likes and shares. And, and the more angry you are and aggressive you are and rude you are and annoying you are, the more likes and shares you receive. So you, so you get a, a, awarded for being an idiot or award, rewarded for being angry or rewarded for shouting. And that's not really how to behave in a community. And so I, I think free actually drives the wrong behavior and paid drives the right behavior, which is one of commitment, trust, intimacy. Let me consider that. Who can I connect you with? Well, oh, that's a good idea. Let me, let me try that. You're more, you're more invested in the conversation. With free, you're more involved in the game of collecting these points or tokens or likes or shares, which arguably are futile. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I think, um, Thomas, moving on to uh, the learnings uh, back in the day from, uh, from the academy. So what would you say or what, have you taken as a result of, 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 of when, you, when, you, when you sold the business at the time? So what are the learnings around community around it that led you and then I guess the journey of thereafter what's happened, which has now led you to be 100. And, but yeah. for, for everyone's reference, you have been running masterminds, networking groups separately, not as publicly as, as you have been, or probably I, I, I haven't been like that exposed to, to, to that, but what, what will be those learnings in, in, in that sense, um, which, I, which one, I would love the audience to learn from, from, from your experience? The one really big learning for me is those 650,000 members were actually 5,000 clubs of about 130 people. Okay. 
And when I had time, we sold the business in 2012. We, we, were, we were running it for 14 years. The big learning for me was 650,000 members sounds like a huge number, which it was. But when you think about 5,000 clubs of 130 people, that's what it actually was. The Sydney Academy, the Farnham Academy, the Brussels Academy, the New York Academy, the San Francisco Academy. Lots of these little, gr little groups, these small intimate groups around the world of between 100 to 150 people, which is Dunbar's number, Dunbar's law, Robin Dunbar from uh, Oxford University, professor anth of anthropology. The, and I, I looked at that and as Penny will, will say, we, we went through uh, a long period of, uh, of grieving or bereavement after we uh, said goodbye to Academy, and it took us a long time to recover from that. And so when, when we came back, it, we wanted to come back small, and then Penny said, well, let's, let's start very small with just mastermind groups of 12, and we built three groups of 12. And then when COVID came along, we said, uh, it's time to build one of those small intimate groups again, but let's just keep it down just like Academy. Let's keep it down to a nice small number that's manageable. And as Penny says, that we could get our arms round and thus, uh, thus 100 people. And then it just started to, to, to settle with me. Oh, goodness me, this is much more significant than we, than we realise. We're actually on, at the beginning of what I call a big, small strategy. And it sounds like an oxymoron and it sounds very confusing. But we, we see it with SUVs. We see, we see giant SUVs 10 years ago. Now we see little copies of them, which are tiny, but they look like big ones. They're, they're big, small. And big, small is coming to all products. You notice it in all devices, phones, cars. It's, and so big, small strategy is actually a label I've given to community building lots and lots of small groups of 100. And I think that's kind of very, very well. Uh, uh, Penny, do you have anything to add on that front? And I guess on the, on the before we move on to the kind of the important elements of the uh, small is the new big thing. Um, I know that many, many people, as I always have, the question is like, okay, so you guys were like the LinkedIn of the day. What happened? Why are you not basically you know why you know what 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 happened and why did these other dudes took that uh, that space but um i just wanted to kind of touch on that and i wanted to, so penny do you have any new contribution mm. maybe to up there yeah i do i see if thomas has the same take on this though um you know thomas and i when we started this it was really deeply ingrained in our values uh, as people and both thomas and i deeply care about people you know we our family is very important to us. And when we have a client, we think of them as family and, and that's genuine, it really is genuine. Um, and so when we started the Academy, you know, when we started in 98, it, 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 we had no idea what we were creating. It was an idea I said to Thomas in a Pizza Express and it was my space and Friends Reunited were around. I said, there's nothing for business people. And Thomas was the most phenomenal connector of people. And he was always being used as the gateway. And I said, wouldn't it be lovely if we just put all these people that you know into a community and let's, let's love them, let's care for them, let's help them. We didn't know what it would become. So it started very, well, it didn't start with, um, you know, let's become multimillionaires, let's dominate the world, let's get to, you know, it didn't come from that place. Um, and so when, I remember the, uh, there was a moment, sorry, can I just ask Thomas, could you mute while I'm talking? I'm getting an echo back sorry um thank you um so when I so so when I I remember a point in 2005 when I was on a, a stage and Facebook and LinkedIn were both there and they were quite new you know relatively new and LinkedIn said we'll never go into so, never go social and Facebook said we'll never go into business and we sat in the middle of well, we believe friendship in business and they didn't okay and I thought well, we're safe because we do um we've all got our space and LinkedIn was very much more corporate and you know and then and Facebook was very much the student and the young person so we felt quite safe however 
what we didn't realize is the world, enough of the world wasn't ready for what we believed in mm -hmm. culturally. Because people wanted to, in business, people didn't want to be friendly. They wanted to cut corners. They wanted to, you know, just stay. You could see it in the way they presented themselves. On LinkedIn, they had their suit and tie on. And on Facebook, they'd be carrying their surfboard. And they didn't want to merge their two personas. And what we were asking people to do that, which meant it took effort. And so we would see some people come in and they would be absolutely amazing. And it's something I think is worth us exploring later about, you know, what, who is a fantastic citizen of a community? What do they look like? Um, but we would see some people come in, they were brilliant. Other people would come in with that corporate identity feeling and, and they would burn their um, reputation very quickly because they weren't willing to be friendly. Hmm. But, you know, you have to have a massive shift in the world, which we now are seeing, not just because of the pandemic, mm -hmm. just because of work, the world, where a lot of people realize that actually having friends around you in business is phenomenal and actually is the best way to grow your business. Back in our day, we were evangelizing that and there wasn't enough people believing in it. Yeah, and I think that's right. And I just really wanted to highlight, Penny, you, Penny wrote this amazing book, which is Business is Personal which kind of, I want to take then now this into leading into the journey of like, of course, we talked about a little bit of the learnings and um, let's think about now as a, what you are, in my opinion, fathers of community. What do you guys see as the key pillars of a community, whether it is in business? By the way, most of my audience are individuals in the events industry you started that way it, the academy was a lot of events a lot of smaller events and everything bigger events but so for them they want to just give i'm giving you the context so that basically the explanation is kind of they can understand that from that point of view so what would be the key pillars of a community in, in b2b as, as you as you see it coming from the words thomas, of wisdom do you want to start with that thomas you have to unmute sorry um, for me, Ricardo, it all comes down to the word intimacy. Okay. And I don't think you can achieve intimacy on LinkedIn or Twitter or Facebook or Instagram. I, I, I see those as systems, machines, platforms, advertising buckets. And we believe that business is personal, as you've just held up the book. And to achieve business is personal you have to be intimate but I think being intimate with people in business just like being intimate with people who are your family and friends is actually good for your health your physical health your mental health your well-being your self-esteem your confidence your gut health I think your your physical being is based on the quality of relationships you have in business and at home with your family and with your friends. And therefore, why not have intimacy in business as well? Because it keeps you healthier and happier and makes you feel good. And so to me, my first pillar would be the one of intimacy. I, I guess Penny, Penny always has a longer list than me, so she'll have a much longer list. But for me, number one is intimacy. No, I think I agree 100%, 100% on paper. I agree, I agree with you, Thomas. What I would also say, and I think a lot of communities are built by people with a guru style of attitude, you know, join my community and listen to me. I'm incredible. We, Thomas and I, turn that completely on its heads. Our members are the incredible ones. We're there to build a culture and to build a, a place for them to care for one another. And in doing that, that means we have to, I think a community manager or a community person has to put aside their desire for their, their reputation, their ego to matter in this and realize that there's a servant leadership style of leadership within it. And a lot of, a lot of that is also about transparency. Um, we are very, very transparent with our members. You know, I 
had a, a, a mentoring session with one of our members yesterday. We were talking about their business and how they grow it. I talked to them about a cash flow forecast and I showed them our cash flow forecast with all our numbers in it. I haven't, we don't have anything to hide about it because I, I truly believe that if you are skilled and confident in your skills, your credibility is not damaged at all by the different experiences you go through. And we are, you know, so I think intimacy and transparency and, you know, we are one of you, we, we care for you, we're a family with you. We're not autocratic parents. Uh, we are in it, in it, pulling up our sleeves and, and, and serving you. And I think that's very important. Um, I guess so, it's been, interesting. Yeah, go, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. It's Thomas, interesting. Pen, Penny uh, talks of the of the guru leaders um, who, who are sort of uh, I'm rich, you're poor, be like me. Follow my system. Here's my recipe. Follow my system. I think we've seen a lot of those guru leaders that Penny describes on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on Instagram, on Facebook. And what they actually are is they're master gamers of a system. They've learned how to game a system almost like a computer game or a gambling game to play the game, to get the followers, to get the likes, to get the shares, to get the right video, to get the right. And to me, it's a giant computer game for them. And they sit at the top of this multi-million stack and say, be like me, have this house, this car, this lifestyle, be like me. And we think that's utter nonsense, mm -hmm. total and utter nonsense. What? people are seeking is, as Penny says, transparency. People are seeking intimacy, they're seeking trust, they're seeking support. Of course, they're seeking recommendations and referrals to the right people. Everybody wants to be in a group of the right people, but defining the right people for you and me, what, what we're trying to do is make sure that when you come into a place that we build, just like at Academy. Everybody used to walk into Academy events. And I went to 2000 Academy events all over the world. And they always used to say to me, they used to walk in and say, Thomas, nice to meet you. Heard great things about Academy. There's loads of people here in this room. Could you just introduce me, Thomas, to the right people? And I used to look across the room and I would say, well, how do you define the right people? And they say, oh, well, you know, because you know all the right people, all the quality people. <laughs> and I used to look back at the room and say to them, well, okay, so there's 100 people in the room here. You want me to walk into the room and pick out the quality people for you? And, and, and what kind of criteria do you want me to use? And I, I think we've, we've always focused on building community around, around the right people with the right values, similar values to our own. I think we attract people with similar values to our own. And I think in terms of organizations that, that you're serving, who are building events and conferences, they're, they're attracting a profile of people like them. They're delivering content and information through those various conferences and events they perhaps haven't made the leap yet to start building these small intimate groups of those people, connecting them, supporting them, developing them, so that they get much deeper relationships with them and do more business with them as a result because they have that intimate relationship with them where they share everything and say, oh, I didn't know, I didn't know you were working on that. Oh, I didn't know you were working on that. If I'd known that, I'd introduce you to Ricardo. If I'd known that, I'd introduce you to Claire. Mm -hmm. And so to me... You can't, you, you can't do intimacy at scale, but what you can do is you can do lots of small. Thus, why I refer to this as a big, small strategy. You, you, you've got, we're moving to a world where people want small, big. <laughs> and delivering that, they want intimacy at scale, which sounds like an oxymoron. And what uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram are delivering is, is a profile and lots of noise and lots of uh, unsafe environments. People want safety. You have to, people have to feel safe. And, and, and they only feel safe. And I think if you look at the output 
of social media around the world, perhaps in politics, we've created an environment which is very unsafe with free. Free has created instability. Free has created unsafe. Free has cre created an environment of disinformation. Free has created distrust. So is free a great thing? Well, it's great for advertisers and it's great for shareholders, but it's not great for people. That is a very interesting element, um, Thomas, that you highlight, because let's say um, most of the people that I've worked with, they operate under one vertical, say a vertical that has a, say, potentially an audience of 5,000, 10,000 people, in, depending on what it is. I also see that we have people in the audience that operate for organizations that hold audiences of hundreds of thousands in all various different verticals. Basically, in the events industry, you have like these big incumbent companies that operate on a large scale. And they all are saying, and it's very interesting that you say that, they all have, we all have, all of these of entrepreneurs have the sponsor that comes here and say, hi, Mr. Event Organizer, I'm here. I'm paying you X amount of money. Introduce the right people to the right quality people. And that's what event organizers sell. We'll introduce you to the right people. Who is the right people? So the question that, and I'm just trying to put myself in the shoes of, of, a, of an event leader or an event CEO of a multi-business say, okay, can you get me here? How do I build lots of small that are intimate and transparent and everything? And that's kind of where the big gap where they're like, how the hell do we get to scale in that sort of environment? And um, if anyone probably from the audience has any question, please, please put it forward. And, and, and because, but I'm just kind of think I'm directing this in, in, in the way that is probably from more from your perspective. So how, how does that work then, and Thomas? Okay. Which more? Okay, I've, I've thought about this a lot, as you can imagine. And I've, I've had 23 years to think about it. <laughs> Um, and if you look at economics of investors, if you look at the way Peter Thiel funded uh, Facebook and the investors went into uh, Instagram and LinkedIn and Twitter, the obsession was with scale and monopoly. Scale from free and monopoly from unlimited capital to get to a billion users or two billion users. Everything was about scale for that IPO, for that shareholder hit. Big, 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 big. But I actually believe you can make more money from fewer people in small intimate groups if you serve them properly. So I, th I think you can make more money from 100 people than 1,000 people. I think you can make more money from, from 100 people than 10,000 people provided you give them the value that they want. And I think whether, you're, whether your clients have 5,000 conference members or 100,000 conference members, they've got to break those, those lists or communities or audiences down into lots and lots of small groups, lots and lots of small groups, and give more at a higher price for more value rather than having a big list that the sponsor comes in and says, can I tap into your 100,000? Can I tap into your 5,000? Because you can't get the right people. You can't identify the right people until you create some kind of exchange for them to invest in, some kind of value for them to invest in. And they won't invest in big. They will invest in small. They won't invest in big noise because they're overwhelmed with messages and emails and notifications. People are swamped with messages. They don't even know which app to open now in the morning to check their messages because there are so many notifications. People want to go to safe places that they trust. And in the same way with the pub analogy that Penny gave earlier, there's a big difference between a Weatherspoons and your local village pub. And we believe more in the local village pub than the Weatherspoons. But there's no reason why you can't have 10,000 village pubs. No reason at all. So you can't, you, your clients have got to build lots of small intimate groups. And then they've got to have a strategy working with you to achieve that.
and an exchange of value that people will pay for. And, and Thomas, which means if I am an entrepreneur, I run my community of 5,000, and again, using the same analogy of the pub, so the landlord is the landlord, right? The landlord cannot split himself or clone himself into the variety of, you know, of areas. Plus, obviously, he must have a, a, a bigger family in which he can kind of do that. How does that do that? And, and again, being in the mind of the leader, of the CEO, of the leader that says, okay, that means an extra investment of time. I know I cannot put uh, a two-year-old uh, experienced individual running these smaller communities. I might need to pay or we need to get better expertise around it. How, how do you start building? How do you start doing that? Because that's kind of time, effort, love, and money. Well, that's a question that Penny can answer beautifully. How do you start building the community culture? Are you asking, Ricardo? It's you know, it's, it's more around in, in the land, like using using the same analogy, lots of small of the land, but but small. if you exactly you you guys are the essence of your community, right? And if if you want to do scale, you need to do small micro communities. This is kind of the the, the word is micro communities, going from big to micro communities. But when you're running a business of events, you know you're you 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 doing the idea. How do I get five micro communities led by who by me the owner or, or, or yeah. the event producer how do you achieve that scale because again money effort and and i guess love <laughs> to give yeah i mean it, there's a there has to be they have to we have to look at almost reverse engineering this so what is the outcome that somebody's wanting from why they're going to do a community in the first place and so let's look at what are the benefits of an organization doing community so we're talking about we're running a community, it's a commercial decision to run a community, and that's different. If it's an organization that says that we're running events and this is need, we would feel we need to create a sense of belonging to our organization or to this event, um, then that, that might be a different strategy. Um, and I think all communities have to be run by someone who's really committed to actually caring for a community. I don't think enough, enough thought goes into the psychometrics and the attitude of the person that's um, being chosen to run a community. So if we look at, you know, people might do Myers-Briggs, they might do DISC, they might do what we do, I'm a identify, modify, adapt um, one. The communication style and the attitude of this servant leader who's going to lead a community is really important, training them and making sure that they're the right person in the first place. To, to run a number, so if I was an event manager I, and I thought, well, I'm going to run a number of them, any event must have segmentation in it. There must be natural market segmentation in the event from, from the type of people that are exhibiting at the events, whatever it is, they will. And so it's not going to be difficult to find what are the commonalities of people and group them into those clusters and say you can join a number of them as someone, but these are the individual communities that we're running around an event. Um, I mean, it's quite interesting. You can see the events spark up instantly with a hashtag on an event. As soon as you're part of a hashtag on Twitter, you're part of that community, aren't you? For that day where you're, you're you know, so communities can pop up really quickly and people immediately get that sense and they make connections through those hashtags. So I don't know whether that's particularly answering your question, but I think that, you know, the point that Thomas is making is that we truly believe through experience that small is what matters to people. And so you've got to look at, and we can't do a whole strategy session here, a generic strategy session. You've got to look at why am I creating community? It has to come from the customer perspective and customers want to know they matter and they don't feel they matter inside a community of a thousand. They don't feel they matter inside a community of 10,000. If you have a small community, they feel they matter. They've been selected into it, for example. And, and, you might put in a policy like we have with Bit100. You know, we've, we've got 62 members now. We've done nearly 700, 000, 700 interviews for that. Therefore, when somebody like yourself gets accepted into the community, it's a win for you because you know how hard we've worked to find somebody with your expertise mm. and your attitude to life. So you can, if you make it that, you know, we've got these communities and we'd like to select you to bring you in and you pre-interview people and it's, now, you might say that's a huge amount of work for someone, but if you're caring for the customer and it's the customer experience you're talking about here, then, then that is the right thing to do. 
And, and I don't Can think I add something talking... to this, Ricardo? Yes, please. Always, Tom. Uh, because uh, Penny and I have spoken at, uh, we've literally spoken at hundreds of conferences around the world, in hundreds of conference centres, in cities all over the world, New York, Las Vegas, Singapore, Sydney, all over the world. And we all know you go into the big hall and you have the 500 people or 1,000 people or sometimes 10,000 people and you have the big keynote speech and you have the guest speaker who's being paid $100,000 or whatever it is to be the big, the big woman or the big guy. And you have the keynote speech and you have the introduction from the chair or the conference owner, the publisher, whoever is the publisher of that conference. And then they say, what we're going to do now, ladies and gentlemen, is we're going to put you into streams. We're going to put you into groups. And over in that room over there, we're going to have the AI room. And over there, we're going to have the climate change room. And over there, we're going to have the blockchain room. And over there, we're going to have the mental health room. And over there, we're going to have the well-being room. And then we're going to have coffee over there. And we're going to have lunch over there, afternoon tea there and dinner there. And then we've got the black tie awards in the hotel later on to give out all the awards for all of these different categories. And this great big room, this mass of 10,000 people then segments down into the things that they like most. And they break down and go off into those different rooms, the coffee room, the AI room, the mental health room, the, the well-being room, the, the blockchain room. And at that point, the big becomes small because the big audience, the big event, the big conference becomes lots of small intimate groups. They're called streams or breakout rooms at these conferences. And they all have their little chair and their little panel and little speakers and the sort of little people, the little speakers are then in the little rooms. That is the opportunity that is never taken advantage of by any conference company in my experience in my whole life. And I have literally spoken at more than a thousand conferences because once they break into those small groups, they're identifying themselves. I'm, I'm interested in mental health. I'm interested in AI. I'm interested in climate change. I'm interested in blockchain. I'm, and that's the moment where the conference company in the streams creates those little groups of a hundred. Now that, that physical event is now moving online. And you can join, as Penny said earlier, there are 10 million groups on Facebook. There's probably a million groups on LinkedIn. Do, are we actively participating in those as business people? No. Um, we, we, we don't trust them. We doubt them. We don't pay for them. Imagine, imagine Facebook launch a, a premium membership, $100 a month. And you can be a premium member of Facebook or a premium member of LinkedIn or a premium member of Twitter. Business people would flock to it because they know by paying, they would take away all the rubbish. And so people, people want small from big, but they still love going to that big conference. They still love hearing that big keynote. They, they want to see the big room. They want to join in on the hashtag on Twitter. They want to tweet but really they want to segment off into the streams. And the moment they segment off into those small intimate groups, that's the moment big becomes small and that small has to be converted into lots and lots of small, lots and lots of little communities. And that's the strategy challenge that all of these conference companies are facing all over the world, particularly when they suddenly see uh, the young 27 year old who's running hopin.com suddenly were three billion dollars and the company is worth eight billion dollars and he only started the company in 2019 and they're thinking how is a how is a conference app like hopping.com suddenly be worth eight billion dollars and mm -hmm. i think he's illustrated and he's illustrating uh, big as small in millions of conferences occurring lots of little ones typically 50 to 100 people are happening hopping literally hundreds every day it's mm -hmm. lots and lots of small which is confirming what i call the big small strategy yeah and i just wanted to kind of um take this into now big 100 because again so as a business person i'm thinking okay 100 people 250 pound a month you reach 100 
that is for sake, two hundred fifty thousand pound a year. Is that the end of it? How, how does that, as a commercial entity, work? How how does that, no, for that. instance, become big, and and what's behind it? So, so when we first started it, we had no roadmap, um, Ricardo. Mm. Um, and I actually think that was the best way, because if you always start with the end in mind, sometimes you get blinded by the opportunities you see. And people did start, so Thomas started getting calls saying, I'd like to invest in your new idea. Um, look, you're obviously onto something. And Thomas would come through to the office and Thomas is more of a, Thomas is much more ambitious than me. He, just, he sees bigger than me. I, um, I'm more cautious and, um, and to a certain extent have a bit of reason to be that now. And he would come in and say, look, somebody wants to invest, you know, and somebody else contact me. They want to run the New York BIP 100 group. They want to run the. And I was seriously starting to get stressed about it because all I could see was the world that we created before uh, that became extremely challenging and wasn't really uh, the way that we wanted to live our lives ultimately. And then we decided actually what needs to happen is people need to know how to, to run groups. So we've, we decided, why don't we just help other people learn how to run their small, intimate community groups? And they could call them BIP100 if they wanted to, if that was right, they could call it something else. Um, so Community 100 um, is, going to be our net, is going to be a project that happens once we've filled our BIP100 and we're, we're delivering it smoothly and having time for them. And then we will be helping people, and we hope to be working with you on this, Ricardo, <laughs> to build their small intimate groups through teaching them that mm -hmm. and that, that process and it'd be called community 100 so build, building on community 100 ricardo uh, which is which is not coming until next year but one of the practical things about having a hundred people in a community, a hundred paying people in a community, and you, you've obviously indicated the business model, the value, the revenue, and so on, is you know yourself, it's very, very hard to get around to having a one-to-one -one with a hundred people. And even if you do one a week, it's two years work. If you do two a week, it's one year's work. And getting to know a hundred people intimately can take 12 months. And therefore, if, if it takes a year to get to know 100 people, that means it actually takes 10 years to get to know 1,000 people. So when you go to these conferences, it's actually overwhelming already the moment you walk into that conference center and see that big keynote speech because you know, oh, my God, who are the right people in this room I need to know? Actually... I think Robin, with his uh, Dunbar's number, 150, has got the number too high. Mm. The reality is, if I talk to all the BIT100 members around the world, getting to know 100 people is probably going to take them between 12 and 18 months. And it's, it's quite enough to have 100, because bear in mind there's, there's a private marketplace happening inside the community, where members are doing business with one another, either as customer or supplier, and they're recommending and referring one another, and they're working on projects together and pitches together and bids together. So that's a lot to handle when every day there's another member and another member and another member. Yeah. Suddenly there's 100, you think. And when we, when we get to the identifying the, the 100 in Bit 100, which we hope will be at the end of March next year, we want to have a conference for just the 100. Uh, around about June next year, certainly next summer. And can you imagine getting into the room with 100 people that have been carefully selected over two years to get into that room? How special those few days together are going to be when we're all together in that room, finally meeting people in the flesh that we've only talked to through Zoom or WhatsApp or Facebook or email. It's going to be very intimate. It's going to be very personal. It's going to be very special. And I think every one of your conference company clients in the world can replicate that. But they've got to have that intention from the beginning that they're building communities where business is personal. 
It's not about volume. It's not about sponsorship. It's not about clicks. It's not about cost per. This is about deep, intimate, special communities that that emerge that evolve into a private marketplace. And that is as what what I think where uh, the business case for smaller communities within organizers is that again, what's the reason why you're doing it? It doesn't necessarily have to be a commercial uh, entity because that's why they have their events, that's why they have the virtual offerings, etc. Many are going into paid membership models, and that kind of provides the answer because that intimacy, that that kind of transparency requires, in essence, in some cases, shielding them from the sponsors that want a piece of that intimate circle, and that needs to be kind of really looked after. And that's kind of where the paid model comes to play. That's kind of where you are built you as an event organizer or you as having a piece of the cake in certain verticals you need to build barriers build that brand connection with you as an individual as a connector as the catalyzer of that in the same way that you guys are doing it and then again you guys have clar clarified again it's not that this just stops at 100 yes there might be the community element there's the element of events that you've got on top of that there's the potential elements where at some point in, in your business model with this particular type of community, because there are like a hundred different diverse experts, it becomes a massive incumbent to potentially generate. There's, there would be, there are, uh, to, to clarify the point to, to many of the uh, business savvy individuals uh, watching this or that could be watching this is it does, it's not going to stop at that kind of 250,000 pounds peak revenue there are all the ways in monetizing which again the collective will then is going to dictate or not not dictate but it's, it's going to be, be very clear ways in which how that collective unity can be monetized for the greater benefit of the community as well that's that's um, right and and also the members themselves some of them may consider building their own community as penny said of their own 100 if, uh, if I take a real example of uh, something, something we're all feeling the pressure of, um, uh, climate change, you've got to be a vegan, you've got to drive an electric car, you've, you've got to uh, buy clothes slowly, you don't want to be part of fast fashion, you've got to not travel, buy food locally. Um, we, we get all these pressures coming at us. And when you want to be part of a community, so you want to be part of the vegan community or the electric vehicle community or the climate change community, or you want to be part of one of these new memes or trends or patterns that are coming up. Um, when, when you look at something like, uh, like electric cars with, with Tesla, Tesla um, sends you an email inviting you to join the Tesla club. And you think, oh, great, I'll click on that. I'll, I'll, I'll go, go and join that. And you see there are six and a half thousand members in the UK. And you mm. think, oh, my God. <laughs> no, no, I don't, want to, I don't want to join that. I don't want to join a membership of six and a half thousand. If, if, there's, if there's 50 or 100 in Farnham, I'm happy to join that. But I don't want to join six and a half thousand across the nation to mm. go and meet at a recharge point and charge up my car. Mm. They they haven't they have they haven't realised that that's not what people want, and they are considered the most sophisticated company in the world at least right now. Um, Google haven't realised this. Facebook haven't realised this. Apple haven't realised this. Twitter haven't realised this. People want small intimate groups and they want them nearby. They, they don't want to join these giant things that connected all over the world because they're unmanageable and people are overwhelmed with information and choice and messages and notifications. We want small. We want yeah. intimate. We want local. You're, you're, you're totally right. And I mean, I think one of the elements that I wanted to highlight was the role that we, uh, that, that, that leaders play within a community, but I think we've covered that through the conversation where you guys are saying you are very active within your community, you're heavily invested. I love that personally as a member of, of, of the online community. So it's been very clear that I would add to the to the pillars of communities that like the involvement of someone that really cares, someone that really loves, someone that really cares about that audience, whether it is a hundred CEOs or a hundred chief purchasing officers or a hundred chief financial officers, you really need to, they're all human beings. So there's 
an element of that intimacy. I'll talk about, and then we're running kind of uh, out of time. I think, Elena, you've asked the question, I think through the, uh, it was about scale without growing that much on the business model. I think I've answered that. If we haven't answered that, Elena, please let's just connect and then I will probably pass that on to Thomas and Penny to answer that uh, if it's okay. Now, platforms, 100, small, everyone always think that the, the community issue is solved with a platform, with a decision. One thing I admire of you, I don't know how you do it, Clubhouse, Facebook, Discord, LinkedIn, WhatsApp, email. Do you need a technology piece to run your community? You've proven me that that's no, but I want to get your understanding. How do you do that? How do you guys manage that? So, because you've made a conscious effort of not having a platform and you, you are everywhere. How do you manage that? that? That's a question for you, Penny, for sure. Um, so I, when you're asking us question, you're meaning from the point of view of us being so omnipresent across all the networks ourselves, Thomas and I, or is it that we're connecting with you all in those places? You, you, both, but predominantly you are serving us members everywhere. <laughs> so yeah. generally the tendency is that, oh, I'm going to launch a community, I'm going to create a Facebook group, or I'm going to run, I'm going to run a community, I'm going to go to one of the tools, whatever, mm. whatever tools, I'm going to go to Guild, I'm going to go to whatever... You guys don't have that because you have a, a policy of engaging on the user's terms wherever well, the user wants to do. Absolutely. So, and you, exactly, exactly. How do you manage that? How do you manage well, that, Benny? It's crazy. I mean, honestly, <laughs> how do you achieve that scale? Because it's, I, I can't even keep myself. Well, it's, um, I mean, remember, we've been doing this for years. And, you know, so we are very fortunate that we've grown up with it all. You know, for, to begin with, every, people only ever had to use Academy and then came in LinkedIn and Facebook yeah. and Twitter. And so we've led up our knowledge of it. But in actually, from a day to day point of view, we're just watching the alerts all the time, wherever we are and seeing them. And, you know, people come to us through Facebook Messenger. They come to us through, as you say, all, you know, all the places. We can try and encourage people to come to one place. But the point is that if you're serving your client, you meet them where they want to be met. And that's the difference now. That's the, that's the incredible advantage that we have now. We've not got a shop front in, in Farnham on the high street that says you've got to drive to see us. We now can come to you where you want us to be. And it is just a mindset that you we feel that you have to have, um, because otherwise you're not going to serve your clients how they want to be served. I think so the I other thing, yeah, I think Ben is absolutely right. I think the other thing, Ricardo, is everyone has their preference. Some people love WhatsApp. Some people hate WhatsApp. Some people love Facebook. Some people hate Facebook. Some people love email. Some people hate email. Some people love LinkedIn. Yeah, Some yeah, people yeah, hate. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. So that <laughs> is kind of that is a kind of a tremendous thing. And then what what I really wanted to touch upon as well is and and, and to highlight uh, the element. And I'm conscious we only have now two minutes. Was that a key element on on the on community? Is it's not only about bring in the community you might hand select them they might apply whatever it is but it's what happens after they say yes what happens after they say or after you've done or individuals have done their pitch of okay by being a member of this community you will get xyz that's where the real work begins which i think also is uh, you guys are leading the way on that i'm super impressed with the onboarding process uh, of oh. when you become a committee because that means it's your need to deliver you know all the promise and you need to now deliver any final thoughts on the onboarding piece it is really important because it's a bit like any experience you know if we're about to buy a tesla for example what is the experience like do they make us feel um that we can work it out we can drive it we feel special all of those things it's critical that first experience and so a lot of effort does go into that it starts from behind us, you know, when we decided that we wanted to create 100 um, places, I ordered in all this merchandise so that we could send a physical gift. And, you know, we had a load of boxes. And so and I actually unboxed over a weekend everything 
and made up a hundred of those boxes. And we know it's going to take maybe 18 months, but, and they sit literally behind me here and they sit in another room. And each time we've got a row of three of them at the moment in the hall, um, which we're personally going to write a letter into each one and send them off. And um, that is like stock. And I was brought up with stock. I had a warehouse of 18, I was sales marketing director of a company, 18 million pounds worth of hardware and software. And we saw the product go out. And to me, it's good for us because we see the pressure and we see it shrinking. And are we actually meeting the commitments we've made to the community of bringing in six new members a month, which is what we want to do for the members. And, and are we keeping our business model rolling in the right way? Um, so it starts with that gift that we send and we've turned something intangible and virtual into something tangible. Um, and it's lovely the way we do it. As you know, we ask it. everybody what's their favorite chocolate. And we have members from all over the world and we have to go searching for that very unusual stuff sometimes. And it's, it's fascinating. We go out sometime nine o'clock at night to our supermarket to buy it. And Thomas and I go to the confectionery and, you know, it's very intimate. So, but then, then it is, how are you going to navigate yourself around? And that is like, we've just gone to university and somebody's going to walk you around and tell you where things are. And then there is a coaching call with me where once you understand that is what do you really want to get out of this? And then we record an intimate video about you to introduce you to the members. So the onboarding process probably takes several hours, but it's very, very important. Um, and we love it. It's very important and we love it. Well, we run out of time, but um, Penny and Thomas, I am very, very grateful for your time, very, very grateful for your knowledge, for your expertise, for your giving. You always have a spirit mm -hmm. of giving. I was kind of talking to someone else in the event industry and said, oh, I know the power is, they're so giving, <laughs> so giving. And oh. I, we're receiving all the love and, and all that stuff. And I think you guys bring a different perspective to uh, an audience, to an industry that has been heavily commercial and then now it's being challenged in various different ways on how to engage with their audiences, how they can build closer relationship with their audiences, how they can get close to the audiences. And I think the example of Beat 100 is a very, very good benchmark to follow, not only because it's just what everyone says. For me, it carries a lot of weight because you guys build one of the biggest uh, communities in the world. Now you're putting your attention and your focus into getting really, really, really close to your customers and to your members. And I think it's something that we all need to listen to and we need there's a lot to learn from. So if anyone needs to speak to you, where can they find you? Just search, right? <laughs> you search. Well, uh, we, yeah, you uh, can yeah. message on WhatsApp, email. Everything is published. Calendar is published. WhatsApp is published. Everything. Or they can go to bit100.club. No one ever in the world is going to have any challenge doing a search and finding Thomas Power or Penny uh -huh. Power. Very likely, Thomas or Penny will sit on your second line. If you're not connected to them, they'll sit probably on your second because the whole wide world's connected to you guys. So thank uh -oh. you very much, guys. God bless you. Thank you very thank much, you. everyone. Thank and you, Ricardo. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.